Coaching talk in the Pac-12. I love the coaching carousel. It's really fun, and you'll love it too. Let's go. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pac-12 with my guy, Richie Bradshaw of Locked On Sun Devils. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with our beloved Conference of Champions. Keep liking, commenting, and subscribing, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch the show, which today is brought to you by Sling TV. Don't miss this week's matchup between USC and Utah in the Pac-12 championship game right here on Sling. Sling, the TV you love for a price you'll love. Try it today. And I am joined by a uh, joyful, happy, optimistic, forward-looking Richie Bradshaw. Forks up for the Sun Devils who have got their new head coach in Kenny Dillingham. And, And Richie, let's just dive right into it. What has the reaction been around Arizona State since Kenny Dillingham has arrived in Tempe? It could not be more positive. You have so much positive fanfare that's going on. And we had a feeling that if Dillingham was the hire, that you were going to get a lot of optimism. But I don't think anyone saw this coming because you have people at the program, students, coaches, uh, players, fans, alumni, that are all believing that Dillingham is the guy to turn the program back around. And I've gone on record many a times to say that the expectations at Arizona State have never been national championship, but rather to contend for the Pac-12 and play for Rose Bowls. That's the expectation. And it feels like Kenny Dillingham can get you there a lot quicker than we may anticipate. I think he can get you instantly back to that seven to eight win team that we're used to seeing out of you every year in year one. And it wouldn't be a surprise to me if he's able to get this program really back on the right track. I'm still not going to say that this is a national champion contending team, but if there is a guy to come into the building, build that image and especially the recruiting aspect, that's got to be the biggest thing is ASU has not been able to recruit the last few years. They just lost a recruit in Colin fight who decommitted after the announcement of Dillingham. But I have a feeling that Dillingham, who's one of the best recruiters in the country We'll be able to turn this around for ASU. Would not be a surprise to me if within the next five years, if everything goes right, ASU is contending for the Pac-12 again. Biggest recruiting name to watch for right now with regards to Kenny Dillingham is Dante Moore because Mm -hmm. he was, and he's still committed to Oregon as we record this on Tuesday night, but that is a very close relationship between Kenny Dillingham and, and Dante Moore. A really Really big time prospect, five star quarterback out of the the Detroit area. So now Number that Dillingham, two behind Arch Manning, <laughs> yes, in, indeed. And some places have him as the best quarterback in the class. Others three. Regardless, he's a big time prospect. I've seen him in person. He's ridiculously accurate with with his ball placement. Quick trigger does a lot of things really really well. I think for Arizona State, you have every reason to be optimistic. You don't have a guy who is trying to come in and do things his way in it in that it's the old ways, right? We're going to, you know, still going to do this. We're going to do this, that, or or the other thing. Like you have a young innovative and, and based on his season at Oregon, first time he's been a play caller, successful offensive mind. I do think there is some risk involved here, Richie. And here's what it is because Kenny Dillingham is 32 years old. He's now the youngest power five head coach in the entire country. He's only been a full-time play caller for one season. Oregon went 9-3 and three this year, and the offense was the driving force behind it, which got Arizona State's attention. But now he's going into a situation, Richie, that, forgive me, my friend, but nope. that is in complete and utter disarray in more mm-hmm. ways than one. You just lost to Arizona, who you thumped 70-7 to seven the year prior. The recruiting has cratered lower than anyone thought imaginable for a school based in the state of Arizona. 
There are looming sanctions coming from the NCAA. No word on what that's going to be. You had a massive, massive exodus of transfers coming into this season, so there's been a lot of roster turnover there. This is, for all intents and purposes, a big-time rebuild. I think it's doable at Arizona State more than some other schools in the Pac-12. I think it's easier to rebuild at ASU, given the program tradition and recruiting base, than, say, a Colorado, a Cal, a Stanford. I think ASU is a much better job than than Stanford, though with the sanctions there, it's, you know, I, I think kind of similar in that sense, perhaps. And you're asking a young guy who's never been a head coach, who's barely been a full-time play caller, to take all of that on. That's a lot of responsibility for someone who is just seven years older than me. Yeah, and I can absolutely tell you, Spencer, that there is definitely some rose-colored glasses that I'm wearing when I'm looking at Kenny Dillingham and everything that he's bringing to the program. I am incredibly excited, and I'm, I am totally willing to admit that I am probably a lot more optimistic than I should be. But I can tell you that this program, like you said, can rebuild itself quicker than other programs can especially if they're able to get that recruiting back on track because Dillingham is a good recruiter. You have these kids in your backyard in Arizona that are very talented. You've got California. That's a stone's throw from you. Texas isn't that far either. You you're in a prime location to be able to draw in recruits. You have one of the biggest colleges in the country with tons of different programs that can excite all sorts of different people to come in. I think the biggest challenge that they're going to face, however, is still going to be the NIL because the Sun Angel Collective has not taken off quite the way that they hoped it would. And that's going to be a massive factor for you because you're still not guaranteed to have all of your players that are on the roster right now stay. Like, sure, Elijah Badger and Jalen Conyers have said that they're coming back, but what's to stop a team like USC from throwing some money their way and getting them to go to another program. ASU needs to be able to keep up with the NIL. And that's something that uh, Dillingham has expressed a lot of interest in is building up the Valley's commitment and getting all, all the cities, Phoenix, Glendale, Peoria, Mesa, all of it inside the Valley to come together, build up this program because the NIL is going to be, just a massive game changer. Look at USC. They went from a, I think like a three or four win team. They are now winning your in for the playoff. So it's, it, it's gotta be a lot of outside factors as well that go into helping Dillingham rebuild the program. But if everyone is willing to buy in, literally buy in, you could be able to turn the program around quicker than maybe you would without it. I think USC is, a, a somewhat of an outlier because they hired such a great coach and, and I, you know, mm-hmm. watch Dillingham's games all season long. The guy knows how to call an offense. He showed some signs of being a young play caller, but overall it was very, very good. The numbers kind of speak for themselves over 40 points a game. Most of the season, 500 yard, like they were really good on that side of the ball. And even if Dillingham is good, I don't know if he'd be able to do a Lincoln Riley, but m- maybe he no. would. Like maybe he would, but I I have doubts about that. I do think that the track record of track record of Arizona State's coaching staff being given time with each of their last few hires to you know build and win and be a good team, I think that's a good sign. If you're Kenny Dillingham, I do think there is a a downside there, which I'll tell you about after I talk to you about our friends over at Bet Online, your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there. From football to basketball to soccer and esports, we've got it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at BetOnline as well. We're always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. BetOnline is where the game starts. I totally understand, Richie, why Kenny Dillingham took this job. It's his alma mater. You could see at the press conference, I don't think he was faking it. You know, he's not Brian Kelly pulling a Southern accent or anything like that, though Brian Kelly's a good football coach. But he was emotional at that presser 
having the opportunity to have that job because that's where he's always wanted to be. The risk that he is taking right now is if it's your dream job and you are a graduate of that school, Scott Frost at Nebraska, Jim Harbaugh at Michigan, you know, sometimes it works, Mario Cristobal at Miami, sometimes it, it, it doesn't, sometimes it needs time, you know, all that sort of stuff. You're only going to get one shot at that school. Right. And if your long-term goal as a coach is to be the head coach of this particular institution because it's where I went to school, it's home, it's, it, it's you know, what I love, and it's where I would love to be, you're only going to get one shot at this. And though Dillingham has shown a lot of promise, he's still a very inexperienced coach. He's never been a head coach before, which is a lot different than being a coordinator. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he'll call plays while he's at ASU, but now he's got to put together a staff at 32 years old. And I think the risk he's taking here is going into the situation. Again, I understand why, because you don't know if that opportunity will come again, because maybe if you say, no, I'm going to wait until the job is a little bit more stable and it's not a full rebuild. Well, what if ASU were to hire someone who comes in and you know ends up staying there for 10 years? Then it may never come available to you, right? So I understand it from that side of it. But the flip side of that coin is 100% that this is not a for sure thing. Is there potential with Dillingham for him to succeed there in, in Tempe? 100%. But is it a done deal? Is it a home run? Like, boom, this is automatically going to work. Everything lines up for success. All he's got to do is come in, make a couple tweaks. Like, no, he has to do something he's never done before in his career. And he has to do it at a place where he is going to feel that extra sense of pressure because he went to school there. And maybe he'll get a little bit more leeway like Scott Frost did than a typical coach would who doesn't have ties to the school. But I think that that element of it is very, very real for Dillingham and Arizona State. 100%. And I like that you brought up that Scott Frost was able to probably buy himself a little extra time because he was the Nebraska alum, and it was the feel-good story of him coming back to the university because that could entirely be the exact same situation for Kenny Dillingham. When you hire Dillingham, you are swinging for the fences. This is as big a boomer bust hire as you're going to get. Because you could get nothing out of a guy who, like you said, has no head coaching experience. He's 32 years old. He's never had to build a staff. He's never had to run a program, let alone a Power 5 program. It's not like he started off at a big sky school and slowly kind of climbed his way up. He went from Saguaro High School to a graduate assistant at Arizona State and then started bouncing around from memphis to auburn to florida state to oregon and now to arizona state like there's a lot of high expectations here for dillingham like he's borderline seen as a prodigy and i don't know if that's a fair expectation to be placed on him i i one of the things that scares me is we talked about usc earlier and i while i'm incredibly excited about this i do not want asu fans to believe that this is the same kind of social experiment where you're taking Lincoln Riley and putting him in USC because Lincoln Riley was already well-established as a coach, as a coordinator, as a staff builder, as a talent evaluator, all of this. Kenny Dillingham, could he get there? Sure, he could, but right now he's not anywhere remotely close to where Lincoln Riley is at this point in his career. And that's probably my biggest fear is thinking that he needs to live up to that expectation in year one when the reality is this could be a three to four year rebuild for the program because it does take a while to get your recruits into the building. That's typically when we talk about college football is rebuilds or you look three to four years because that's how long it takes for all of your recruits to come in to your program to see how everything kind of funnels out and while i do think that dillingham could find immediate success because i think he is a great coach and a great recruiter and i am placing some faith in him to give himself good support structures with smart veteran coaches and whatnot this could also definitely be another three and nine team in 2023 while you're trying to get your footing underneath you yeah i, I think it's 
higher ceiling, lower floor, sort of higher. It's not where I would have gone. Not that I don't think Dillingham could be a head coach because he clearly knows how to put together an offense, and that is you know pretty important when when playing football. There's another side of the ball as well, but if you can score a lot of points, you can typically win a good amount of games and at least keep people interested, right? Like Arizona was just five and seven this year. I mean, it was an amazing five and seven. I know it makes Richie's ears bleed to to hear me say that and whatnot, but it's just the reality of the situation. And one know, year out the other, the, Spencer, don't the, worry. <laughs> though, they were, <laughs> though they were under 500, you the saw watch. the potential because they were scoring points and the offense was there. And I think for Arizona State, at the very least, that could be something that that they could that they that they're going to try and mimic here. Essentially, is like, look, we're not there yet. We're still a couple of years away. Arizona is still a couple of years away from having a roster of guys who can compete for you know a spot in the Pac-12 championship game, right? But you see it on one side, and Dillingham should be able to come in if he's you know as good as Arizona State thinks that he could be. And come in and, and fix the offense so you're not putting up just seven points at home against Oregon State in in the final home game of of the year. But I think there's a lot of risk, but I think there's potentially some some real upside there, especially considering that USC and UCLA are leaving in a couple of years. I think it creates a void for teams to go up to the top. And I don't think Arizona State is the least likely team that could go up there and suddenly be a perennial top 25 team if the conference does in fact stay together and you know you have the 10 teams that remain you add probably San Diego State and maybe one other to stay as a Pac-12 then you need someone else to kind of jump into that void I think Arizona State's a candidate for that but uh, another school that's capable of being at the top is Stanford and they've got a coaching opening as well and um, we're going to go through some names here unlocked on Pac-12 today because this is this is my favorite part when games are not going on, the games are the best part, right? Monday shows after a full week of games won't have that. Well, we'll have it for bowl season and whatnot, but still not not quite the same, right? It's not the same. No, I will miss that dearly here on the show until next season. And trust me, I will still be here. But that, that Stanford opening presents one of the most interesting things we can do here on a show like this, and that is discuss potential candidates. And there is a list. Like Stewie's song and Family Guy, there is a little list. Well, it's actually a pretty big list and whatnot, which is a funny song. But anyway, I I digress. A lot of names being thrown out with regards to the Stanford job. I like some of them. I don't like the other ones as much. So, Richie, let's uh, let's go get going on this front. The one that is at the top of everybody's list, I'm not quite as high on as everybody else, but I understand why, and it's Chris Peterson. And Chris Peterson has done nothing but win games as a college football head coach. That's what he did at Boise State. That's what he did at Washington. And then when Chris Peterson wasn't there, Washington fell down, and now they are clearly right back up on the horse, so to speak. But what do you think about that being... I don't know what Stanford's priorities are. They haven't really made that clear, so this is you know, kind of speculative and such, such, but that's the name that I see get tossed around a lot. What do you make, Richie, of Chris Peterson at Stanford? I think there's a fit component, but there's something else I think wouldn't work as well. I think that right now Stanford is going to be looking for one of the most qualified candidates that they could possibly find. And when you're looking at resumes, Chris Peterson's resume is going to be just about as good as any other candidate that you have out there. Wildly successful at Boise State. Made them one of like the programs that was outside of a Power 5 conference to go and play football at. Goes to Washington, takes them to the playoff, makes them an incredibly talented team, and kind of leaves abruptly, honestly. Like, he didn't need to leave Washington. He could still. Yeah, it's not be like the program was in was it was in disarray. He just decided, I'm going to step aside now. Right, exactly. So I think that's something that also is going to work out in his favor throughout this process. Is kind of that logic of I left and I could have kept going because Washington was still a good program, and this that and the other kind of thing. But with Peterson, you have a proven winner and a guy who just knows football. 
Chris Peterson is one of those guys who will forget more about football in his life than I will ever learn. The I to pick his brain for an hour would be one of the best treats I could ever get. And for a program like Stanford, that is just so smart and like both book smart and play smart. They, they would love a guy like Peterson. It feels like a seamless fit. Now it isn't a seamless fit. There's definitely some things that you're going to bring up here in just a second that could kind of make it not as great a fit. And who knows, he might not even want the, to coach anymore because again, he willingly stepped away from Washington. He might not be interested in coming back to coaching or at least maybe this Stanford position. But I think this would be a home run hire for Stanford. I'm absolutely with the rest of the group think that is saying that Chris Peterson is a perfect hire. I I'm super boring and I, I got to agree. I think it'd be a, a great fit. Here's where I push back a little bit on the Chris Peterson idea. Hit me. Washington was not up there showing him the door. They did not say, we really want Chris Peterson to go. Chris decided to go. Right. And I think part of the reason Chris decided to go, and this is somewhat speculative on my part, but I think with regards to why David Shaw realized it was time to step aside, It's a component of that as well. This is a new age and era of college football with the transfer portal and NIL and the fact that recruiting gets more and more competitive and intense and round the clock 24-7, 365 every single year. I think a lot of the older coaches in college football are a little turned off by it. I do. And so... Though Peterson may be able to go to Stanford and win games, I don't know if he's going to be able to, combined with Stanford's stringent academic admission standards, which you know they're not going to just suddenly lighten up on because it's such a big part of what they do as an institution. I just wonder if you would be able to compete at a high level consistently if you have an older coach who's not as into that stuff and who it's at the very least a new thing for that he doesn't fully understand or appreciate the importance of. I'm not saying he doesn't recognize it, but it's different when you're a young coach who can connect with players and relate to them more on that particular front. And then you'd be at Stanford, where one of the big questions I have about the program right now going forward is, are they going to just be falling behind here because they can't? bring kids in via the transfer portal basically it will like everybody else I think that's one that that's the biggest thing I see with Peterson is like does he really want to cut like he would have to want it so so bad because it's such a grind now and he stepped away before NIL and the one one time exemption in the transfer portal so I just question whether or not he'd be the right guy to step in and say yeah, okay, you're going to keep Stanford competitive with these other components that weren't really there as prominently when he was a head coach. And I love that you brought up the Stanford academic aspect because I think that Stanford's brand itself is 100% like people want to play for Stanford. This isn't this isn't a program that doesn't have historical success. They've had Andrew Luck. They've had John Elway. They've had plenty of great players Christian McCaffrey. Go through there. Mm-hmm. 100%. It's not as though like just because the academics are so high and they're they're basically like a West Coast version of an Ivy League school, like this this doesn't mean they can't put together a good football team. But like you said with the NIL, which Stanford has not done a great job of similarly to Arizona State, but even more so the transfer portal, you can't just pluck guys. You can't just pluck a five-star kid because his GPA is 2.5 and, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, wherever you stand on that, Stanford is not going to abandon that aspect of their school. No, I can't see it. They're not going to start plucking Richie Bradshaw's into their program because he's a good athlete. No, he doesn't have (laughs) it between the ears. Okay. Well, I already knew that. Yeah. So like, (laughs) I don't know what to tell you. Sorry. Like, I know you're going to be the number one pick, but you're not, you're not uh, as, as good a GPA average as we would like for this program and again right wrong or indifferent wherever you stand on it 
it doesn't matter because that's the Stanford philosophy. And that is always going to be an obstacle for them. Yeah, don't worry, Richie. I don't think anyone was accusing you of being Einstein. I mean, after all, you, you've got Arizona, you've got Arizona State on your sweatshirt. <laughs> I mean, it's, we ain't we ain't going to Arizona State to play school. <laughs> that's exactly right. Okay, let's go to the other candidates here uh, to wrap up the show today. Did you ever see Ted Two? By the way, of course I saw Ted. There's too. a great joke in there about Arizona State, which is not repeatable for the airwaves. So we're just going to end it right there, and I'll tell you to go look it up on your own time. Yeah, but, I was going to say you can take a look. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep, it, yep, it's, yep, it's, yep. You know. Hilarious. Okay. All right. Moving on. So uh, Bronco Mendenhall is another name. He was a coach at Virginia for a long time. He interviewed for the Colorado job. By the way, the Buffs have offered it to Deion Sanders. No word on whether or not he's leaning towards accepting that or not, or if, you know, Mendenhall is their number two or number three or where that is. I think that could be kind of a fit. Virginia, tough academic school. I think he understands that. And, and you have to remember with this Stanford job is they're not going to hire just the guy who they think is the best football coach, but they are going to hire the person who they think can win games and is also the best representation yes. of Stanford for them. Of, of Stanford, right? That's why David Shaw got a long leash longer than what other coaches could get at other programs, right? Mark Helfrich at Oregon went four and eight in one year. He was out the door instantly. They're like, nope, sorry. That's that's not right. Washington that was the right thing to do, though. Right. Right. And then Washington, <laughs> and Jim, Washington with Jimmy Lake, the same thing. Four and eight. Nope. Sorry. You're gone. That's not good enough. We're, we have higher standards here. Doesn't help when you Stanford, fight. Kids. Well, yeah, no hitting hitting kids <laughs> in the helmet. That's that's no good either. But anyway, so that's all in the past and such. And the, the present here for Stanford is there's still, I think, an institution looking for that sort of candidate. I do think Chris Peterson fits that mold. I think Mendenhall, from what I know, does as well. Um, let's go through the names that I have seen circulating on the interwebs w- for this opening that I don't think work. Uh, Derek Mason was a Stanford defensive coordinator, went to take the head coaching job at Vanderbilt, which is probably the worst Power 5 job in the country for football. Um, the defenses here at Oklahoma State, kind of leans towards indicating that he doesn't have the X's and O's chops that he once did. And I don't think Stanford needs to go to a former coach, which is also why I say Mike Bloomgren, their old offensive line coach, look, they need to rebuild in the print in the trenches for sure, but he's the head coach at rice and they're, you know, just kind of a middling conference USA team. I'm not a huge fan of that one. Uh, Bill O'Brien doesn't feel Stanford. Nothing, nothing about that nothing. feels, feels Stanford. I can't see that happening at all. Uh, here's the other one I don't think will work that Richie wishes would work as a Baltimore Ravens fan. Greg, Greg Roman, Greg Roman. What would you say if he was no longer the Ravens OC and he was instead Stanford's head coach? I would say they might score points, but I don't know what kind of CEO he is. I don't know what kind of recruiter he's going to be, and I think you can do better than that. I know Richie would take a would it would, take it'd it. It would be like that SpongeBob episode where where SpongeBob decides to live with the jellyfish, and Squidward's like "so long, goodbye," and like he closes the door <laughs> and he starts partying. Like that would be me, just like. Thanks for everything, Greg. You were the assistant coach of the year in 2019. Slam the door and just start partying, knowing that T. Martin's <laughs> going to get promoted for us. Yeah. Um, so those are names I don't think are in the running. But I think Mike Elko at Duke, a proud academic institution, he had a really good season this year. I think Stanford's got a much stronger football brand than Duke and could maybe lure him away, but not as likely. Here's the name, though, Richie. Troy Taylor at Sacramento State. He has turned around that program to be a really good, they are a national championship contending FCS football team this year. He was once the offensive coordinator at Utah. He's got some roots in the Pac-12. He turned around the Hornets big time. And then, think about this. Who was the last big time coach that Stanford hired that brought them to the national stage? Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh. Where did Jim Harbaugh come from? The FCS level where he went and turned around San Diego into a winning program before going to Stanford. San Diego. (laughs) Yeah, let's not go down that path either. But (laughs) Chris Peterson, Bronco Mendenhall, Mike Elko, Troy Taylor. I I really think if I'm Stanford, Richie, I look at Troy Taylor and say, 
Is is that is that the next Harbaugh? I don't know if he is, but the comparison is there. He's got West Coast ties. There is a very real component for these schools of saying like, hey, this guy reminds us of that previous coach we hired who worked. I say, why? I mean, look at Washington. They hired a Fresno State head coach, a Mountain West head coach who was winning a lot of games. And boom, they're two for two on that front. What do you think? I think it'd be a pretty good move. Like it's, it's one of those, like it's, it's not the flashy, it's not the sexy move, right? Which some fans are going to want, but we've talked about this plenty at this point in the podcast. Stanford is not going to make that move and they're going to make the, the like funny, not funny, the smart move for a program that prides itself on being smart. And that might be the smart move that they could make. Let me throw a name at you. Okay. That I just kind of popped into my head as I was thinking about this. Okay. This would this would take a lot to pry him from the program. This is this is another head coach, but with the pretty good success that he's had at Baylor, would you try for Dave Aranda? Aranda, I believe is how it's pronounced. But I, so I saw that on 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 a list somewhere. I don't I don't remember specifically where. And I wasn't, I it didn't click in my head of like, oh, that's got to be their guy. But I do believe that Dave Aranda, it represents the caliber of character as a coach, given his reputation at Baylor, that Stanford is looking for. Right. I question whether he would go from the Big 12 to the Pac-12 to the and Pac-12. from Baylor to Stanford. But It'd if I'm... Downgrade. But if I'm Stanford, Stanford's also got a huge endowment, though. It could throw some money at him. If I'm Stanford, I would 100% be interested in Dave Aranda. I I think he is a good, solid coach, and he would not have to win immediately. Or he would not have to win right away, and he'd be given ample time. I think that's the appeal to Stanford job. No one's expecting you to come in and do what right. Lincoln Riley did at USC or Kalen DeBoer up at Washington this year. So I, I, okay, I'll throw that into the list. So Troy Taylor, Mike Elko, Bronco Mendenhall, Chris Peterson, Dave Aranda, kind of our top names like to watch for five. here at, at Locked On Pac-12 at this point in time. I think you can make a case for all of them. If you've got any questions on this stuff, let me know on Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore Pac-12. Richie Bradshaw is at Richie Brads with a Z36 on Twitter, host of Locked On Sun Devils, Monday through Friday on YouTube and wherever you listen to your podcasts, which is where you can get this show as well. Richie, I can't wait for bowl season, but all this stuff, I can't wait for the off season either because my goodness, it is going to be fun. The 2023 college football hype train is alive and well. Yeah, it is. And it's it's going to be a, a lot of fun because it'll be the final hurrah for the L.A. schools. And yeah, you'll be seeing Lots some young head coaches. And there's there's all sorts of reasons to be excited about the Conference of Champions in 2023. Very much so. And we will continue to cover it. I hope you will continue to tune in. Appreciate everyone listening. See you next time and have a wonderful rest of your day.